Okay, hi. Today we are very, very excited to have uh, Liz Law to join us. She's a fellow vet as well, and she has also got a story to tell. We're going to ask about how did Liz become a vet, and what does she think about veterinary medicine, and why does she become a vet in the first place? So, Liz, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, can we just start off with a very, very simple question? Why did you become a vet? Well, Lennon, I've always wanted to be a vet, actually, from when I was really little, probably since I knew what the word meant. And before that, I probably used to, this is going to sound weird, I used to want to be an animal, I used to pretend I was an animal, so I've always loved animals, <laughs> isn't that weird? So, um, yeah, it just seemed like a natural thing to do, to want to do a job that you could help treat animals. It's a perfect mm -hmm. job. So um, I, I ended up doing it, not in a straightforward way. Um, I did zoology first and then veterinary medicine. Um, wow. I'm not a straight A student, but it just shows, you know, you don't have to be. No. And, and here I am. Yeah. And um, did you, what sort of vetting do you do right now? Um, well, it's just first opinion, small animal. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it's mainly cats and dogs, but the odd exotic thrown in there, really. Yeah. How was, uh, how was vet school like? Um, difficult uh scary they're two main words that I've come to mind <laughs> when I remember back to vet school yeah hard work but and when I was a vet student I remember thinking I can't imagine being a vet I can't imagine getting there I can't imagine doing that really and now I am so here we are I don't know if anyone else has felt like that <laughs> I Go think uh, you hear very, very similar stories. Vet school is certainly yeah. no joke, really. Um, what was your what 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 kept me going in vet college? You know, to push through five years. Well, actually, um, I did it in four years purely because I had the degree already. But um, similar, like-minded people go through it with me. Really, my friends on that vet course in the first year, we were doing two years and one, and so we'd all got degrees already. We we're all similar age. So we all hung out together and, you know, we all obviously still have that drive to do it, probably more so than first degree people, perhaps, mm -hmm. because yeah. we've tried really hard to get here. So, yeah, it's just that motivation, really, and all study together and, yeah, just enjoying all aspects of it as well. Um, yeah, Amazing. I guess. And how was, uh, how was uh, working life like after you graduated? Well, uh, for me, I've actually been working in the same job since I graduated, which is probably oh. quite unusual. Um, yeah. So I've gone from new grad to experienced vet in the same practice. Because it's a small practice, first opinion, that's always a sort of job I see myself being in, just a small friendly practice. And I get on well with all the staff and we're like a little family, really. And it's a small town and it's near to where I'm from. So it's near my parents. And, yeah, it's just, yeah, I just really enjoy it. So here I still am. <laughs> yeah. When you first joined, the, I mean, I like your perspective on this, really. When you first joined the practice after you graduated, mm. did you feel that um, you were totally prepared? What what sort of challenges you faced along the way when you first joined, when you first became a vet, put it this way? Yeah, so new, new grads, I think, you know, it's really scary, isn't it? That first day starting, you don't know what you're going to see. And, and you don't know if you're going to know what to do but um you know I was really lucky I've got a really good supportive boss and she's always there even now like you can still ring her up if you see you'll see still see something different you've not seen before and uh get get another opinion on it so I knew she was really supportive from the beginning always there and you know at that time we were doing on call as well so I was doing on call which is actually quite important thinking about it looking back and because that's where you see the most interesting cases, really. Uh, but she's always on the end of the phone and she'd come in to help me out any time of day if I needed her. So it's nice to have that support there and we get on really well. So which is really important, isn't it? When you're first in practice, you need to have someone to rely on because if you don't have that support, probably won't be enjoying it so much. True. Yeah, very, very true. Very, very true. Um, and what, what were your sort of the biggest challenges when you first started? Do, do you remember, was it like, surgery client communication or what um trying to think really far back now because it's like 10 years ago um you know what actually it's probably 
and maybe obviously I've got a jaded view really because of what happened to me but obviously dealing with complaints and serious complaints at that and you know before that big one I had you know the odd complaint and you, you do take them to heart and I think they're quite hard to deal with thinking a client doesn't like you or you've done something wrong or you missed something and they're quite hard to deal with aren't they to get over things like that but really you just put them down to experience and makes you better you know that's what I think well, anyway just just to dig a little bit deeper because I'm quite interesting for uh, I'm quite interested in your perspective why do you think it is why do you think vets take it personally not all but why do you think you take you took it personally when somebody said that you know when they when they made a complaint so to speak I guess because I felt like I tried as much as I could and that maybe you just put too much pressure on yourself as well and you want the client to like you as well maybe I, um mm. you know you want them to get on with you and you want them to sort of yeah you, know, you want to have a good working relationship with a client don't you and when they complain against you kind of take uh, that's when I, I would have took it to heart maybe I'm not so bad now I, you know I'm, I'm quite used to it now. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, so this, this is quite a common occurrence right? getting complaints from vets especially in our social media you see everywhere so what, yeah. what is your take how, how do you cope with uh, complaints from clients well obviously I had a, a really tough experience dealing with the worst one it could be when a client you know the clients complained to the RCBS and it went to, through a full hearing including me and my boss which was really tough on us all mm -hmm. and in the end we got through it um, and that's why I had to share my experience writing that booklet really to other vets mm -hmm. to make to highlight that really it, and it, it is after I did that I realized that's something that's actually getting more frequent and more and more vets are going through things like that not just like you say RCBS complaints but just general complaints and they, like you said we do I think generally try kind of take it to heart a bit too much and try hard to move on and then it makes us probably fall out of love with the job and not want to do it anymore which is really hard isn't it very very true very very true I, I, I will ask you more about that particular incident in a bit um, I like your perspective on this as well because it sounds as though you know you you wanted to be a vet and you worked very very hard to become a vet and you became a vet yeah. in your career of your dreams so to speak mm -hmm. and it is not uncommon when I tell uh, others that I'm a vet you get a very similar comment of um, wow I've always wanted to do that but yeah. is, or what are various reasons um, a few different things that is quite sort of uh, slightly disturbing or quite a little alarming about the profession is that the depression rate is actually quite high as we know, the vet life phone calls have doubled every year mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for the last few years. And uh, more, more and more vets are sort of uh, asking for help, so to speak. And also the attrition rate, the dropout rate is quite high. Many vets stop becoming yeah. vets for a lot of various reasons. Um, and last but not least, you know, the suicide rate is also quite uh, obvious and alarming. We are yeah. twice more likely to end our lives compared to the medical profession and four times more likely than the general public. So why i like to see your perspective on it why do you think that is then considering it is a career that i mean it's a profession that many people say they actually like and want to be but they didn't um why is such a desirable career so to speak a profession um having such statistics yeah um yeah it's a really sad statistic isn't it and actually mm. i think there's lots of different reasons why like many different reasons for every individual but ones that I hear and obviously going through that hearing is he made me consider it to be and I'm not even that kind of person that you could imagine would consider it but I think you just think when you go through something like that it's like a way out and you could think well then I don't have to deal with that anymore and you don't have that over you and you know actually with our job when you train to do something like we do we can only probably imagine ourselves doing that. So when you have that prospect of that being taken away from you, mm. you can't imagine yourself doing anything else, then what else is there to do? So I, th I did feel a bit trapped like that, to be honest. And I can totally imagine why a lot of people do it, haven't gone through that, actually. So, and the scary thought as well is you know, we as vets have access to those drugs that we could easily do it. And we put the animals to sleep regularly that we kind of see it as like a normal is a you know a, a easing suffering so in our heads we could probably see that as a 
you know, a way to, you know, cure what, what's really affecting us if it's that bad. And, you know, like, like say, if you are going through something that bad, it's like a way out and it's not, but you might be thinking at the time. And, and I know I felt like that actually, mm. sad to say, but um, you, you can come through it. You mm. can come out the other side. I think Liz, what you went through was quite horrendous and quite yeah. specific really. Um, there are also many other sort of uh, counterparts out there, many other vets who actually did not go through what you went through, but nonetheless, they also stopped being a vet or they are also depressed. Sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> a vet with a dog, surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, very, very sweet. Hi, that's Teddy. What's his name? That's Teddy. He's Barky. Teddy. <laughs> <Amazing. He's a laughs> <God one. laughs> excellent um yeah so what what about those people who have not gone through what you went through but they also you know they don't feel good about the profession so yeah. they either feel depressed or they quit the job or yeah what what are your thoughts about that what what is it about this profession that potentially makes that well like I said, other reasons obviously other than what i had to go through is the stress of the job generally because there are many different stresses in this job so depending on the nature of it you might be on call you might not get on with staff it be clients uh, that are really difficult difficult cases you might not feel confident and then all you know maybe a combination of all these things together or one or a multitude of those things build up over time I think um, and affect you in different ways and it depends how you might deal with them as an individual how to you know do the job really and how to cope with it I don't know if you feel similar about that <laughs> um, for me it's slightly different I, I, I think I, well, I love that thing I, I just actually I enjoy the job a lot and I good. take the plus and minus together and I enjoy vetting a lot you know like you said I cannot imagine doing anything else uh, having said that you know there are it is just my own thoughts but um yeah, yeah so I, I do enjoy what i'm doing well yeah i do as well now um mm. but there have been times when it happened <laughs> um mm. definitely but then i think what comes with time and experience is you do you know find a way to to you know get get better and, and then enjoy the job that better as well mm. that's yeah. uh yeah, let's talk about the, 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 the incident that happened to you because I, I do believe we need to highlight that really. Mm. Um, so in your own words, will you be able to just tell us briefly what happened and what you went through and what was your thought process and what helped you in the end and what made you to write that very, very useful booklet which you just did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, well, I was back in 2017 now. Um, I was doing, a, I was on call. And I got called out to a GDB, so uh, twisted stomach of an old uh, crossbreed. And, um, you know, the clients would do anything for their dog and they wanted me to try the surgery. And that was only the second one I've ever done. <laughs> so I did call my boss and help me um, do it. I got him stabilised and, you know, prepped for surgery and we're in there and she helped me do the op and that all went well, and, you know, despite him being old and everything. And we went through all the rest of the owners before this. Um, so it's a long story. Um, in the end, he, he did die overnight and they're really upset, obviously. But the reason, main reason why they were upset really was because they weren't told he was going to be on his own overnight. In our small practice, we are not a hospital. Mm -hmm. So we never, no. you know, had anyone overnight. So yeah. when we finished in the middle of the night, we thought, oh, well, he's fine. He'll be all right till morning which is pretty, and it's not ideal, but this is what we normally do. And this doesn't happen very often, I have to add. And um, so, long story short, they complained to the RCBS that day, it happened, <laughs> um, and complained to us, and it all went from there. And it took till 2019 to go to a hearing in which they involved me for doing that and my boss for false advertising on 24 seven care because we had that as our strap line along the building 24 seven care for your pets which they thought to mean there's someone there all the time so right. it maybe her allegations were more serious than mine 
Her mind was like a clinical judgment issue, um, but hers were more dishonest and misleading allegations, so maybe more serious in the eyes of the RCBS. But she, luckily, her case got dismissed. We had to both go through it together, and it was really stressful going through that. It took a you know over the course of two weeks. <laughs> Uh, in 2019 um, yeah. and I got a reprimand in the end but after that actually what was worse than that going for the hearing was um, the owners told their story to the tabloids and that's where I think it got more public actually I don't think many people would have realized had, you know if it was just through the RCBS hearing even though they're public yeah. going to the tabloids made it really public and it was yeah. all shared on Facebook and uh, you know everywhere wow. and that, that was really awful how why did it take it happened in 2017 but the hearing was only in 2019 mm -hmm. so what happened in those two years so i mean the incident happened november 17 um but all through then 2018 was basically the rcbs gathering their evidence so witness statements right. and that, that would take months in between each stage so you'd, you'd be going ages without hearing anything and then all of a sudden you get another letter oh it's going to this stage oh we need some witness statements and you know and then till January 19 we found out it was going to a hearing yeah so right. that was, okay. so yeah. It was it was a good almost 15 months so to speak yeah well and how did you manage in that before the hearing yeah I mean like I say that was a really tough time and that's when you know I was really low and felt like jacking it in really <laughs> so yeah um a lot to deal with I don't honestly I look back and I think really it's just having my friends and family supporting me mm. saying you'll get through it and think of ways you can you know just you know things you can distract yourself with hobbies and go you know say back then go on holidays and mm. try and take your mind off it Mm. and actually thinking about other alternatives you could do not just mm. being a vet if the worst happened yeah mm. you're always going to think the worst might happen so mm. think, oh, well actually i could do other things mm. you know so it's not the end of the world if you couldn't be a vet but it'd just be a different way of life i suppose but uh, luckily i'm glad to say i'm still a vet <laughs> yeah I'm very pleased for that and that mm. brings me to the next uh, question really i mean this 2011 you have been through what most vets, including myself, were considered fairly horrendous experience. Mm. Why are you still a vet? Well, I'm still a vet. Yeah, good question. Um, well, it took me a long time to come to terms with what happened. Even after I got the reprimand, you know, and carry on being being a vet the same I was, but I, my heart wasn't in it to be honest. Going through that, plus on the other side, on um, at work, um, the other thing that was happening during all this actually my boss sold the practice to IVC mm -hmm. and um so we're going through changes there in indirect consequence one of my colleagues left I mean there's only three and a half vets at our place so one of my colleagues had his noticing he was going to another practice um there's also IVC so it was really sad to see him go and then because he was working there longer than me so we working mm -hmm. together a long time mm -hmm. and then it, we took a while finding another vet that was another issue and we were doing on call still so me and my boss were doing sharing it between the two of us I was really tough and I, I was really unhappy at that point mm -hmm. but luckily we found another vet who's a new grad so we sort of got her involved and you know made me feel like oh well at least I can help this new grad out mm -hmm. and then the pandemic hit and loads of people got furloughed and I was the only vet because I'm only experienced full-time vet. My boss had to shield. I was the only full-time vet, and I, so yeah. and there's one part-time vet who could do work when I could be off. And then the new grad, she got furloughed. So yeah, it was just me working, you know, last the first lockdown. So then I thought, well, I've got to do this now. So and then I thought, well, I'm doing it, and I can do it quite well, and I'm doing a good job actually. And and it actually got, you know, I worked with a really good team. We got on really well, and it made me enjoy my job again. Isn't that weird? Like in that lockdown, made me fall in love with my, with my job again. It's, so it's and then yeah. come out the other side, and I'm back to probably better than where I was before. So 
yeah, sounds I'm like, enjoying the job again. Yeah, it sounds like it was a blessing. It gave you a sense of purpose. And yeah. the purpose being the only event you managed to, or rather you were able to excel in what you do and find a passion back again. Yeah. That, that is uh, very, very interesting. So what, what would you say you have learned from this incident, not COVID, but the RCVS hearing incident? Like what would it, uh, what would you do different now? <laughs> or what advice would you have for other people who may be going yeah. through the same thing, unfortunately? Yeah, well, like you said, the weird thing about my case is like it's unique, but lots of vets could like did relate and thought that could have been me or I've mm -hmm. done that before. Mm -hmm. Like it's just a bit of bad luck in the clients, unfortunately. But obviously, you realise, yeah, I should have explained. But you, sometimes you forget things, and it have, you know we're human; we all make mistakes, don't we? Mm -hmm. But obviously, they have consequences. So. Initially, even after that happened, that incident happened, we changed our consent form straight away to highlight the fact there's no one there overnight. Mm -hmm. We'd always make anyone aware now, never make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. And really, we don't like leaving things overnight because of that risk of anything like that happening again. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you think, well, it's not ideal, but some people can't afford to take their pets all the way to vets now. Really expensive. Not everyone has. Um, not everyone has uh, insurance. And then you're kind of limiting some clients, a lot of clients around here, really very, it's quite an umbrella of clients, to be honest, where, what we, where, we ha where we are. But some clients just want you to just do, do your best with them at the time. When we used to do out of hours, we don't do out of hours anymore. Yeah. And we used to do out of hours, we used to mostly see people to put their old pets to sleep, yeah. if I'm honest. Yeah. And they'd love to see the vet they know to do that in the middle of the night. But mm. now they'll have to take their pets half an hour down the road mm. to someone they don't know. Mm. And and who knows what they, they do. And uh, and it'd be a lot more expensive. So that's another issue, um, except, you know, not to do with other vets at all. But, um, yeah, so there's that going on in our practice, I suppose, now. So uh, already we've changed things that we know that to avoid that sort of thing happening again. Mm. So you've got to just learn from your mistakes and um, just if you think, you, you know, at the end of it all, you still want to be a vet, you can still be a vet. And if you think, you know, it's not for me anymore, there are so many other things you can do in the end. Um, but for now, you know, I'm, I'm happy again doing what I'm doing, thankfully. What, yeah. what would you say would be your top three highlights of reason, really, the, 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 the sort of... Uh, the, the the your why your you you want to be a vet what would be a why yeah. oh top that's hard um because there's so many actually um <laughs> you know yeah. actually working with animals every day and helping them <laughs> is the main one i suppose um being able to investigate and hopefully treat and find out what's wrong is that i really enjoy um problem solving <laughs> so you know so I really enjoy that side of things um I enjoy actually doing surgeries like not big surgeries just normal surgery I just like enjoy all, all the aspects again like what I used to do um there's not one specific thing mm. so yeah because it's so varied it's different every day you'll see something different every day it's interesting it is isn't it yeah. yeah um what would your advice be to a um, you know, a, somebody doing A levels or GCSEs, or say that you know, Liz, I want to be a vet. You have been a vet for 10, 11 years. Um, <laughs> what what advice can you give me? Um, well, um, I think if if you're really serious on being a vet, you should try and go see practice at uh, your local vets and see if that really is just something for you, and really try hard to muck in with watching operations and the consults and you know see how how it really is to be honest because even like like I said before you don't need straight A's but obviously it helps mm. but you know yes the the academic side is important but actually seeing what is like to be a vet is also really important good yeah. well Liz it's been extremely refreshing and I've learned so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. That. And I do wish you the best in your career. If anybody, in any audience want to sort of reach out to you to ask you what we experience or to find out about a very, very useful booklet that you have uh, written and presented, 
what's the best way to find you? Um, well, my email address is lizlawvet at gmail.com. So you can always drop me an email there. And then I've got a website with that booklet on, and it's uh, https colon slash slash how to survive an RCVS hearing dot wordpress dot com. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure that's in the show notes. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your time, Liz, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, and to you. Take care.